My name is Quentin Skinner, and I'm here as the general editor of the Cambridge University Press series, Cambridge Texts in the History of Political Thought. The series began publishing in the late 1980s, and by now more than 120 volumes have appeared, the most recent of which is the subject of today's webinar. This volume is entitled Albert Ben Dicey, Writings on Democracy and the Referendum. And here it is. And the editor of the volume, about whom I first want to say a few words, is Professor Gregory Conti. Greg took his BA at the University of Chicago, and then he did his PhD at Harvard University, um, after which he held a fellowship at the University of Cambridge from 2016 to 2018, the, the year in which he was appointed to his present position as assistant professor in politics at Princeton University. Well, Greg has published a large number of important articles on 19th and 20th century ideas about representation and democratic and the anti-democratic thought. He's also published a major monograph on the 19th century British Parliament, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 2019. And he has a further monograph forthcoming on the legal and political writer on whom we're concentrating this afternoon, Albert Ben Dicey. Today we're focusing on Dicey's views about the use of referendums. <laughs> now you may have noticed, and I hope this next observation won't seem too parochial, that we are holding this webinar on a date which is, at least to citizens of the United Kingdom, an extremely important date in the use of referendums, that's to say the 23rd of June. The device of the referendum has very rarely been used UK-wide, but it was so used on the 23rd of June 2016 to decide on whether the UK should leave the European Union, which it did. Well, um, if you don't think that disqualifies referenda straight off, then uh, we now turn to the question of referendums and what we should think of them, and specifically to Venn Dicey and to Professor Conti's edition of his numerous essays on this exact topic. Now, Dicey, uh, I was brought up to think of as a major constitutional theorist, but I think it would be fair to say that nowadays, He's not nearly as well known as he deserves to be. So I think, Greg, that a good way to begin would be if I could simply ask you to say something about who was Albert Ben Dicey and some of the significant events of his life. Uh, yeah, well, great. Thanks. It's really a, a pleasure, a pleasure to be here with you, Quentin. Um, so yeah. Uh, Albert Ben Dicey, um, I think one of the things really that makes him interesting is uh, simply that he lived quite, uh, quite a long life and witnessed an incredible amount of social and political change. So he was born in 1835, uh, shortly after the Great Reform Act and still a couple of years before Victoria's coronation. And he uh, doesn't die until 1922. So after the Russian Revolution and World War I. His life and background, I think, exemplify uh, what historians have called the intellectual aristocracy of the 19th century. So this sort of distinctive stratum, stratum of often interrelated familially uh, members of the ascendant professional classes who set a great deal of the tone of Victorian politics and letters. So through his family, he's connected to both the uh, uh, elite of kind of the evangelical world. That's where his um, middle name Ben comes from. Also, his cousin is the uh, inventor of the Venn diagram, the uh, mathematician John Venn, and, um, and uh, two leading Whig circles. Uh, he goes on to Oxford. He practices law for a while. He writes a lot of journalism, is a very prolific uh, journalist, does some legal work without a, a ton of success, and uh, as a young man is on kind of the radical end of the, uh, the Liberal Party, 
Then in 1822, he returns to Oxford as Venerian Professor of English Law, um, which is where he writes his most famous works, uh, above all, the Introduction to the Study of the Law of the Constitution and uh, Lectures on the Relation of Law and Public Opinion. And he becomes uh, a quite well-known public moralist, uh, pronouncing on a wide range of issues in the press. And most of all, from 1886 on, after Gladstone's conversion to home rule, he leaves the Liberal Party and becomes one of the sort of foremost uh, liberal unionist uh, intellectuals. So proselytizing tirelessly against home rule and for the maintenance of the union with Ireland. So those are just some of the broad outlines of, uh, of, of his life. Well, that's a wonderful introduction, um, and indeed an instance of um, Noel Annan's phrase about the intellectual aristocracy, quite remarkably mm -hmm. so, yes. Now, you mentioned the introduction to the study of law and the Constitution, um, as late as 1885, is it? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a, a bit about that book? I mean, as you said, that is the most famous book, not the work on referendums, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, and it's not until 1885, which means he's he's already 50 when he writes it, which I suppose is not that late by you know the standards of uh, a lot of great legal and political writers. You know, uh, lucky Paris. he wasn't trying to get tenure though. No, no, indeed. indeed. Um, but yeah, he he had been rather frustrated until he he writes it. But uh, you know, luckily for him, it's sort of instantly hailed as as a masterpiece. Um, and it's, it's due to that work that he is considered sort of the high priest of orthodox uh, legal theory, both of the era and almost still to this day. Um, and so the book, yeah, comes out in 1885. It goes through eight editions just within his lifetime and, uh, and many more, many more since. So, you know, the law of the Constitution is a, is a pretty complex work. Um, and I think it's, it's often been, been misunderstood. Uh, for one thing, it's often claimed that it's a work that exemplifies sort of the peak of Victorian complacency and self-satisfaction. I think that goes a, a bit too far, since even within the, the text, it's clear that Dicey thinks Britain's constitutional heritage, while fortunate on the whole, is, is far from the only way to arrive at a decent liberal representative government. But anyway, the, the basic kind of promise of the book is that Britain's constitution, which might seem like a kind of impenetrable morass, since famously it's unwritten, um, and it's not been codified like the American or the French, can nonetheless be grasped as um, deriving from a few key principles. And his key theses are that these guiding principles are basically two, parliamentary sovereignty and the rule of law. And there's a sort of further uh, major argument, which is that um, a few conventions have played a vital role in the constitutional order. So that's sort of the basic architecture of, uh, of the book. And, um, you know, I think the book has attained a great afterlife, uh, largely as a foil for later constitutional theorists, right, who want to uh, push back against his articulation of some of these concepts. But also, I think, simply because it's a repository for some of the major formulations of liberal value sense. Uh, the book is largely responsible for minting the rule of law as a kind of cardinal formulation of a, of a key value of modern, um, modern liberal states. One last thing I would say about the, this work, you know, like any great book, there are a number of debates about how exactly to interpret its character. And uh, as one would expect uh, there to be, um, uh, you know, about such, such a work. I think while it's clear that a lot of Dicey's own biases and predilections do slip in, certainly not an apolitical work. Nonetheless, the law of the constitution was primarily intended as an interpretation of the constitution as it then existed, rather than a piece of advocacy for his own views. And for that reason, the book could be taken up by people on opposing sides and put to different uses. And notably to Dicey's chagrin, Gladstone immediately cited the book's doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty in justification of the Home Rule Bill that Dicey so detested. And um, it's, you know, in part because it is not in the first instance a piece of advocacy yeah. that uh, it could be instantly hailed by basically all sides as a, as a sort of masterpiece. Fascinating. 
Um, we need to get on to the referendum in a moment, mm. but um, I was, I am very struck to learn that he was such a passionate opponent of home rule. Mm. I think I'm right in remembering that he was a passionate opponent of votes for women as well, wasn't he? I mean, what about some other ideas of, of Dicey? Yeah. yeah, no, you're right. It's, um, yeah, and so Dicey was, he was, uh, by the end of his life, um, interestingly, an opponent of women's suffrage. And he, he wrote a book um, collecting a number of his sort of shorter writings against women's suffrage um, in the early 20th century called, I think, Letters to a Friend Against Votes for Women. Earlier on in his life, he'd actually endorsed women's suffrage. When he was in more of a full-on million phase, he had been an advocate for women's suffrage. Mm. And, um, you know, Dicey, while... You know, the, the edition, as I said, is called something like Writings on Democracy and the Referendum. So, you know, I, I, it's not exclusively, it doesn't exclusively consist of pieces just on the referendum. I think Dicey would now be someone who we could fairly comfortably call a sort of democratic theorist. I mean, yeah. democracy is an overarching theme. Obviously, he doesn't write about it with the systematicity of a, you know, a, a Hobbes. Um, he's not a systematic political philosopher in that sense. But, you know, I think democracy is is a guiding theme that he comes back to over the course of his life. And so maybe just to say a few things about that before we jump right specifically into the referendum. OK, you know, let, let us let us do that. I mean, we should come to the referendum shortly, but your edition, after all, is called really Writings on Democracy and the Referendum. So, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Tell us just, about Dicey on Democracy. Yeah, just real quick to give some broad strokes to lead in, I think. One interesting thing to note is that as a young man, he had really been on the radical democratic wing of the, of the Liberal Party in the run up to the second Reform Act. Um, he's even in a, in a particular review said to be the most zealous member of the kind of academic liberal faction in favor of it. And at that time, he favors a very large extension of the franchise, um, partially um, and without a lot of the reservations about the tyranny of the majority that people like Mill had, for instance. And uh, a great deal of this comes from his admiration for America. And as you point, you know, as you raised at that time, interestingly, he is even in favor of women's suffrage. Mm -hmm. Later on, as he ages, I think quite interestingly, and particularly after the passage of the Third Reform Act, he seems to lose interest, I think, in some of these questions about justifying democracy from first principles and takes up this sort of Tocquevillian posture that, you know, we democracy is a fait accompli. It's a uh, permanent and immovable fact of modern life. And the only questions are sort of how to make it more coherent and better functioning and avoid its worst propensities. And he does in some ways grow more conservative. As I say, he abandons women's suffrage. But one way in which he, uh, I think, you know, we have to say does not grow more conservative is that at that time, he becomes um, quite interested in the referendum. Uh, to the point that, you know, his role here, I think, can't, it's hard really to, over, to overstate his importance. He's very uh, important even in, in bringing the word into the English language. So before Dicey starts writing, the word is, is barely used in, uh, in, in the popular press. He draws, he helps popularize the word from his own study of the Swiss constitution. And, um, you know, Dicey enunciates a number of principled reasons for supporting the referendum, but one of his main reasons for it is simply political, to something you mentioned, Quentin. It is, uh, for him, a weapon against Irish home rule. Yeah. He thought it was obvious that if a vote was taken of the entire United Kingdom, uh, which uh, he thought you would have to do, um, he, he believed that a vote just uh, of the Irish on home rule would be unacceptable since home rule would mean a new constitutional settlement for the whole state. Mm -hmm. And therefore democratic values meant every elector throughout the United Kingdom should get to weigh in. Well, he thought in that case, England's great numerical weight would simply crush Irish votes. And um, so there's this very strong political reason for him to support it. One interesting thing though, is that he actually does uh, come to like uh, the referendum and become interested in it slightly before Gladstone's commitment to home rule. So. It's not entirely, uh, you know, a device purely of partisan convenience for him, but that's certainly one of his his main, you know, his main motives for being such a stubborn advocate over the last several decades of his life. Yes. 
and, and yet you're saying that his endorsement of the use of the referendum predates his sense that this would be a valuable device in relation to stopping home rule. Well, there are some articles you can find from uh, the years before Gladstone where endorsement is probably too strong, but he's already saying this is quite an interesting thing. There do seem to be pretty positive reasons. Uh, you know, there, there do seem to be important reasons why we might want to consider bringing the referendum into uh, British system. Um, and, but there's a bit more of a kind of weight. He's not as zealous an advocate. It's, it's not really until 1890, which is the first of the um, pieces that I include on the referendum in this edition, that I think he becomes um, incredibly forthright in his support. That's obviously after Budstone comes out in favor of home rule. But you can already see that he's become a kind of student of it. And he's saying, this might solve a number of problems with our party system. But yeah, the, the, the sort of full-throated support is, is a bit later. But he's already interested, and he's, he's a kind of student of it, and he can see things that he likes about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, maybe just one last word on democracy. I think one interesting thing about Dicey relative to his time is that um, one thing we tend to think about 19th century liberals is that they loved localism, voluntary associations. And just an interesting point about Dicey is that he, he really wasn't a fan of that. And there's, Dicey was a very strong supporter of uh, centralization. Yeah. And, um, you know, for him, democracy always went along with a quite centralized and strong state. And uh, that's just a sort of interesting wrinkle in his, uh, in his writing, when you judge him against this kind of million uh, yeah. token tradition. Yeah, very um, interesting. And of course, by the end of the century, Maitland and all the uh, anti exactly. look, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, since, Greg, this is the 23rd of June, may mm -hmm. I ask you how the version of the referendum that Dicey went on to advocate would compare with the Brexit referendum? I mean, mm -hmm. think of various different types of referendum, can't one? What would you want to say about that? Indeed, yeah. yeah Dicey is, is quite an interesting figure for the Brexit debate. And it's not a surprise that his name did come up uh, kind of on, on both sides occasionally um, in, in those years. On the one hand, um, and I think this comes out in, in the edition, he did believe that constitutional questions in a democracy required uh, the holding of popular votes to be fully legitimate. On the other hand, he would only accept very specific mechanism for doing so. And you know, his was hardly a, a vision of radical democracy that he offered uh, for this. Um, he did not countenance, for example, any form of the initiative. So that's off the table um, in, in his uh, uh, vision of, um, of democracy. Uh, and he would certainly, I think, not have approved of the way that the Brexit vote was conducted. So Dicey did, not accept, Dicey did not accept um, government called referendums on a general question, the legal force of which was unclear. Yeah. Dicey, by contrast, uh, advocated only a version of what we would now call, I think, uh, something like mandatory post-legislative constitutional referendums. That's probably the best, even though that's a big clunky phrase, that's probably the best way to succinctly distill his version of it, which he took and adapted from uh, sort of one part of uh, Swiss democracy. Ah, yes. That is, uh, for Dicey, what Dicey wanted was that a referendum would be triggered automatically when certain types of bills were in play. Those which he called a bit hazily, we must admit, constitutional or fundamental bills. So mm -hmm. on, on his preferred policy, bills which touch on constitutional terrain after having passed uh, both chambers of parliament would be submitted to the electorate for confirmation or refusal. So again, what's submitted is the bill, and it is after passage by um, the Houses of Parliament. And uh, a couple of things to say about this, which are, which are interesting. Um, Dicey was not entirely consistent in demarcating this category of constitutional or fundamental legislation. And this is obviously a difficulty in um, a system that lacks a codified enacted constitution. And a number of critics in his time point this out to him. You know, how are you going to define constitutional in a um, 
how are you going to define constitutional when we lack a rigid constitution? Mm. And so Dicey, you know, he dithers a bit on this. Certain core aspects of public law for him are always included. Mm -hmm. So changes to the electoral system, questions about, say, the abolition of monarchy, disestablishment of the church, um, issues mm -hmm. about devolution. So there you have home rule. Anything that looks like a transference of sovereignty or major change to the administrative system. But he also sometimes stretched the notion of constitutional. I think this is why he sometimes uses the other phrase fundamental yeah. to mean things like major changes to uh, the character of state policy. So things like poor relief, change yeah. to the poor law slips in, or major changes to education. Yeah. So there's admittedly a real slipperiness that he has, has there. Yes. It's interesting, though, because the invocation of the concept of certain fundamental laws does carry us back to the Bill of Rights, which is the nearest to a written constitution we have. Uh, Indeed. It's an 89 settlement, yeah. Mm -hmm. But it, yeah, and... The, but kind of interestingly, in his in his vision, you know, he says things like individual rights would not count really as constitutional matters. So specifically, when he writes about the Swiss uh, Constitution, he says, eh, "Yeah, you know, isn't mm -hmm. it curious that the Swiss say the matters of individual rights are are kind of constitutional? Those aren't matters of the distribution of sovereign power. You know, those aren't really." Um, so yes. anyway, yeah, I think we we must admit he was uh, sort of unsatisfactorily unclear here and. What's most important for him is that on any way you slice it, he thinks home rule is obviously covered. Except you that know. it does sound something rather like the American case where there would have to be um, referendum and indeed supermajority for uh, altering constitutions. And he seems what? to be focusing on the notion of altering the constitution. Indeed, yeah. So it, it's certainly the case that he believes that one effect of this, and this is the way, is that some form of distinction between constitutional and ordinary law is going to be brought into the British system. And yeah. that's incredibly important to him. So, and you're going to be able to do that though, without having to have a whole constitution and without having to, uh, you know, go through the process of uh, writing a new constitution. You'll simply, he thinks, have to pass a referendum act, which defines a set of um, constitutional bills for which in the future, this referendum process will play out after bills have passed, um, you know, the two houses of parliament. And you just leave it at that, and that's enough to prevent what he says is the, is the fatal flaw of the British system, which is that uh, parliament can um, act both as a constituent power and as a um, ordinary legislature. Yes, he thinks that will be enough to end that particular problem, and that is for him required by. Um, you know, required by democracy. Yes. Uh, modern democracy yeah. requires such a distinction. Um, yeah. on this, um, well, if uh, I speak for a moment about the relationship to democracy, one thing that I do wonder about is how much he would have had the place of referendums in mind in the American Constitution. Mm. What would he think about a supermajority? Yeah, well, he, he is against, he is against, well, I, I shouldn't even necessarily say that he's against because he doesn't really write directly against it, but he doesn't advocate a supermajority. No. So um, uh, he says, basically, it seems, um, you know, what he wants is simply a straight up majority vote of the entire, of the entire UK. It's interesting. He never envisions um, votes of specific constituent parts of the UK, right? Now, that's obviously just baked in based on his dislike of home rule. Also, yeah. in a way, based on his dislike of secession movements more generally, he take, this is, I think, an imprint, he writes about this generally, of his absolute hatred of the South and the American Civil War. Secession yeah. is to him, any form of secession or devolution is almost... Treason. Uh, yeah, and it's, and it's against a, a kind of democratic principle. Yeah. Uh, claims. Um, yeah. So um, the... Uh, but he claims that basically, I think, what this is, is a form of popular veto. And you don't need, I, I think a, for him, you don't need a super majority because the whole point is to verify that a, uh, verify that parliament hasn't deviated from a, what he calls a true popular majority. So the worry is that parliament, parliamentary opinion can come unglued from popular. Mm -hmm. And so what he says here is that what we want to do is to bring the people in as a kind of third chamber. 
yes. and give the majority of the electorate a veto in the way that under in a monarchical age, the um, you know the monarch would have had a chance to reject legislation yeah. through the veto. And so Menor he has a very um, uh, a kind of negative voice conception of what it means to exercise sovereignty. In a monarchical age, fundamentally, sovereignty is demonstrated not by the fact that the king wrote legislation, but by the fact that he could throw it out when he wished. And uh, in a democratic age, popular sovereignty is demonstrated by the fact that uh, the people, which he says straightforwardly means in practice, simply a majority of the electorate can, for uh, fundamental constitutional legislation, uh, reject it when it so wishes. Yeah. But it does not, as I said before, have any of these kind of positive, um, you know, Rousseauvian sorts of connotations. He yeah. hates Rousseau, he doesn't like the initiative, and he's very, um, in general, uninterested in, say, the American progressives who are putting more uh, robust forms of direct democracy uh, oh, yeah. on the table. Same yes. Time. yes. Well, very yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. well, look, I mean, we're, we're halfway through the, the webinar nearly, and um, these have been extremely illuminating answers. But before we move on to a question and answer period, I wonder if you'd allow me a completely hypothetical question to end with. Mm -hmm. So what would Dicey, how would you imagine Dicey thinking about the referendum in the UK in 2016. One thing, by the way, that strikes me very interestingly in relation to that question is mm. Dutch's preoccupation with the, the parts of the United Kingdom. I mean, the United Kingdom is not a federation, but we all speak now of it containing four nations. Mm -hmm. um, now, on some views of referendums, mm -hmm. have to be a majority of those nations. Yeah. Would he agree with that? Well, I think it, I think Dicey certainly accepted that, um, say, in a federal system, you had to have double majorities. So we accept that about Switzerland. And then when the Australian constitution comes in at the start of the 20th century, he accepts that. Good, uh, yes. yes. However, I think he would not have accepted it here on the grounds that, again, he simply, if you look at what he said, he just says the idea that the Irish are a people separate from the British people is false. I see. I think here, and again, we look back and that's something we can't really abide Mount Dicey. But I think Dicey would not have accepted the idea that Britain was a multinational state. And the mm -hmm. fact that, um, or that the United Kingdom is a multinational state, I should say. Yeah. The fact that that conception of it won so clearly, I think shows a way in which Dicey's own view of the character of the United Kingdom loss. Yes. You know, Dicey's vision of liberal unionism lost out pretty decisively. It's not that he thought there were no, you know, that he was entirely against uh, diversity or thought that say Scottishness had to completely be submerged out. You know, he loved the Anglo-Scottish union, thought yes. this was a great triumph of statecraft and thought that, you know, the fact that Scottish law had been preserved, you know, thought you could preserve a certain amount of diversity yeah. but thought that this was um, one separate from any impulse toward federation, which he yeah. mostly disliked. For him, the trajectory of history was towards uh, big centralized states. Yes. And, yeah. um, and federalism, as he said, um, was always a stage toward greater, uni greater unity. Yeah. It should not be a part of unwinding kind of once unified states. Yes. So I think um, in the particular case of the United Kingdom, um, he would mark it as a, uh, a kind of instance of, of the loss of his own vision of, of uh, statehood and, um, you know, his conception of a kind of integral nation state to a vision of a multinational state. Yeah. Well, it's a very recent um, development, isn't it? Because, I mean, it's very recently that we've talked about four nations, and this stems from stressing devolution instead of centralization, I suppose. But it is a striking thought that if Indeed. we had welcomed the Australian system in England, the 2016 referendum would have been lost. Indeed, and I think that's, you know, I think that's true. Um, 
And so again, I think with Dicey, well, we know it's was, because Scotland voted against and Ireland voted against. Indeed, yeah. So okay. you know, again, Dicey says where there's uh, where there's a federation, double majorities do follow. As a you know, that's that's a necessary part. Yeah. Um, so uh, of of holding these referendums. So. Well, it's a very you... complex issue. Uh, I mean, as you've now shown us, uh, and very beautifully, if I may say so. Um, but I, I think now, if we may, since we're um, beyond our half hour, it would be very good to hear from our audience, whom I'm sure will have lots of things they want to ask you, Greg. And so um, we turn to the question and answer part of the webinar. Now, as Victoria said at the outset, if you want to put a question to Greg, you need to put your camera on and click uh, either the foot or the side of your screen on reactions, and then click the icon for the raised hand. And then once you've done all that, I'll be in a position to recognize questions. Well, thank you so much for the first half, Greg. That's been absolutely wonderful. And let us now move to the questions. So it's the duty of chairs when the audience begins by being shy to um, ask further questions. I've got a lot of further questions, but uh, just to finish where we were then, he would on the whole have endorsed UK 2016. Well, I don't know. I, I, again, I think it's, it's tricky. I think the idea of, um, you know, for Dicey, the, an important part of the referendum is, as he says, this is a, it's a fully procedural and legislative process. And a major hope that he asked for is that it will, it will diminish the effects of the party system and help to, as he says, separate men from measures. It's a part of, he thinks, unwinding the uh, overall power that, that parties have. And when you look back at the way Brexit played out, I mean, for, and for him, the reason why, why that will take place is that it's a fully automatic calling of the referendum on a text of a bill once it's passed through parliament. And he thinks this means that uh, insofar as is possible, it gives people a chance to reflect on, uh, you know, the kind of um, importance of a particular piece of legislation for public welfare um, regardless of party affiliation, he even hopes that this one of the knock on effects of this will be the end of collective cabinet responsibility. Yeah, because he says, you know, people will be free to canvas for or against the bill. And if we decide, oh, this is a great uh, chancellor of the uh, exchequer. Uh, yeah, he was against the bill, but, you know, he does a wonderful job um, managing the finances of the state. Well, he'll just stay in power. Yes. After, uh, and he he hopes truly that the knock on effects will be of this will be an unwinding of the idea that party needs to be the orienting principle of administration in British life, and that you can yeah. even move towards something like what he sees in Switzerland, a uh, collegial nonpartisan executive. I mean, he has rather grandiose ideas about uh, the way in which the introduction of the referendum can affect the spirit of the, uh, the and working of the constitution overall. Yeah. I'm gonna have to say that, you know, that's certainly not how Brexit plays out. In fact, you know, as soon as a, you have a government staking its existence on the passage of the bill, he could never have accepted that. The whole point yeah. is to yeah. disaggregate men from measures. The idea that you call, um, you know, you call a referendum basically to resolve an intra-party dispute. You know, that's not something he could yeah. uh, accept. And I think most of all, the difficulty is about agenda setting. He likes that you have a referendum on the text of the bill itself, because insofar as is possible in that case, he thinks these difficulties about agenda setting are diminished. But how you pose a question, what does it mean? When you call um, 
a referendum on a very open-ended um, question such as uh, was posed in the Brexit case. All of those things I think are um, extremely uh, kind of, they reek of what uh, Dicey calls the plebiscite. Uh, and he used the plebiscite always pejoratively to refer to Napoleonic practice. Yep. And uh, so I don't know that he exactly could have accepted that. But again, he also could not have accepted the idea that major constitutional questions uh, were never set before the people. Yeah. So I think we just have to say that there are parts of uh, you know, the 2016 referendum that he could have accepted and others that he, that he could not have. Yes. So maybe that's- now we, that. we have um, uh, a question which has come in in defiance of, of how I suggested it be done, but that's absolutely fine. Um, a rather eminent questioner, Professor Jonathan Clark, has put a question into Q&A. So I'll read it out, uh, and very interesting it is. Did Dicey contemplate referenda on other substantive questions? He, he asks, well, for example, women's suffrage or the capital punishment. Mm. So women's suffrage, definitely, is women's suffrage uh, affects the electoral system. And uh, for Dicey, that's always one of the core issues on which you would hold uh, hold referendum. So the electoral system is always, always one of those. Um, now for Dicey, because referendums would always be held using the present parliamentary electorate, it's men who are going to vote. In that sense, there's a default kind of conservatism to his, um, uh, you know, to to his use of the referendum, kind of structural conservatism to it. You're always using the national parliamentary electorate again, so no targeted electorates of the uh, you know for constituent um, elements of uh, you know for constituent countries of the United Kingdom in the case of devolution referendums. Nor would he have tolerated, say, expanding the uh, um, the voting base in for say women's suffrage to include women on this particular issue. Um, but on capital punishment, um, I don't think he ever writes about capital punishment. He did not want tariff reform, interestingly, to be put before the uh, electorate, which is something that um, conservatives do consider using a referendum for um, in the early 20th century. There's a major movement behind that. And Dicey did not consider that to be a constitutional issue, interestingly. So uh, again, as I said, Dicey is a little, you know, he's, he's quite slippery about what exactly falls into this category of constitutional or fundamental, but he does at least want it not to just be any policy issue of great importance. Um, and I'd have to look back, but so far as I know, capital punishment is not, that, that does not feature. Um, and, um, you know, so women's suffrage, yes, capital punishment, no, so far as I as I know. Now, um, we have um, a continuing wish on the part of the audience to ask questions through the Q&A, and we have yet another very eminent questioner here in the form of Professor Bruce Cooklick. Mm. Um, hi there, Bruce. Wonderful to see your name here. Right. Now, Bruce actually has two questions for you, and one is that he would like you to say something about Dicey's relations, connections um, connect with Badgett. Mm. But he's also interested, which I think is a, a, an interesting point indeed, uh, in the fact that um, some of these questions are counterfactual. Mm. Indeed, I asked a counterfactual question, and Bruce asks, are you comfortable with this? Um, so on, well, you mean, mean the counterfactual, meaning how would Dicey have felt about Brexit in 2016? Yeah, well, I, I mean, that is counterfactual, yes. <laughs> exactly. I mean, well, I, um, I guess, I'm, am I comfortable with it? Uh, sure, why not? I mean, one has to, well, you know, you just have to accept that these responses are quite speculative. Um, but I think, you know, we can see that Dicey made quite clear what he didn't like about alternative referendum proposals in his time, right? So Dicey weighs in on the initiative. He doesn't like it. He does not like any referendums that um, are left to the discretion of the executive. That's clear. He, um, and he makes quite clear why he, he really only likes 
his modified version of the Swiss mandatory constitutional referendum. So, you know, I think it's not entirely out of line to say, well, okay, given that that's the only form he's willing to endorse in his own time, what, what would he have said about the Brexit referendum? Um, but yeah, one, one has to, you know, admit that we're just, just speculating and people might go ahead and I would just say, if you're interested, you can read the volume. And if you think after reading the volume that uh, I've drawn some, some bad inferences about that, uh, I'd love to hear from you. Please write me and tell me that you think I speculated improperly. About Badgett, this is a great question. If I could just say real quickly a word about Badgett to his first point. Um, Dicey um, thought Badgett was uh, England's greatest political genius, I think, after Burke. Um, uh, and as a young man, he thinks he kind of puts Mill highest, but uh, as he ages, he, you know, Badgett assumes the, the, the top rank for him. Um, and I, th I think one way of thinking about Dicey um, is that he is a sort of a more democratized Badgett in a lot of ways. Um, and uh, I think his style of writing is pretty similar to Badgett, the way um, history and law and politics are interwoven. Obviously, he's much more of a legal writer than Badgett was, but the, especially in his many articles for The Nation, they read a lot like uh, Badgett's writing for the for the Economist, um, and uh, he always he always admired Badgett and thought of Badgett as you know a kind of great uh, seer and diagnostician. Um, and on uh, a few particular issues, he always remains very close to Badgett. For example, in his rejection of proportional representation, um, which remains uh, of course an important issue in British uh, constitutional. Um, debates, but he basically lifts directly from Badgett his own antagonism towards uh, proportional representation. So those are just a few thoughts there. Very good. Well, good. Now, we continue uh, with uh, people, people taking the law into their own hands, and very eminent people they all are. We now have Professor Anthony Black. Um, sorry not to see their faces, but anyway, here are their thoughts, and that's the main thing. And um, Anthony writes, should a referendum be in two stages, first mm. the principle and then the detailed legislation? And he wants you to think about the case of the in and out referendum on Scottish independence. Mm -hmm. Should a second referendum be allowed um, after a certain number of years? Um, because a yes would mean no more referenda. Yeah. Um... It's a good question. Say, I think it's it, it's quite. I think it depends. It depends on the exact on the on the exact issue. Um, I think um, it, it's quite hard in the case of um, you know something like Brexit, where there will be um, a long period of negotiations with an, an, an external actor. Um, but I do think for kind of domestic legislation um, or say constitutional legislation, maybe a lot of this stuff should be in two stages. And in a number of countries there have been. So, you know, um, you could say, you can put to the people, should there be a revision of the constitution? And then, or calling of a, constitu a constitutional convention. And then when they say yes, you, after the constitution is revised, you put the whole constitution to them. And then that's held up for another referendum. So that's often been advocated in a number of places. I think that's in fact the way it's done. So there's two stages in that sense. You kind of put, um, you know, a question about do you want a general uh, form of constitutional revision, and then the you know the general and then the specific are are each put to them. I don't see any uh, objection to that. And in principle, I don't see any objection to the two stages. I mean, yeah. Um, but there might be there might be practical reasons why, in particular instances, it it can't work. Um, but yeah, again, I don't see um, I don't see uh, principled reasons why two stages, where again you have the general and then the specific posed, uh, would be unacceptable on sort of democratic grounds. I don't see why. Mm. Uh, Anthony, do you want to come back on that at all? Let's see. 
Ah, here is Anthony Black with his hand up. Very good. So do you want to say something, Anthony? Have you got your, um, you need to unmute, unmute yourself. Anthony, are you there? Well, I've got the hand up and I've got Anthony Black, but no picture of him. And uh, there, I think he's I've unmuted it now. Oh, uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay, well, most European countries have it in two stages. I'm Indeed. sure several countries voted to leave, but then when they were presented with the uh, detailed um, <clears throat> legislation and maybe a little more discussion, they voted to stay. I think mm -hmm. Denmark, I think Portugal, if my memory serves me. Mm -hmm. I think it's really very, I mean, it's pretty obvious now that the, most of the people in this country um, now would prefer not to leave. Now they see what it means, i.e. poverty. Yeah. Yes, I think in, I, think in uh, I don't see a principled reason why you, couldn't, why you couldn't have two stages, so long as it's kind of a, a matter of actually putting before people two, two separate issues. Again, if, if the first one's the general principle and the second is the specific instantiation of the principle. I do think there are principle grounds not to ask the same question twice in a short period, right? Um, I think there, you, you know, I'm inclined to follow something like uh, Condorcet or Jefferson or something like that and basically say, you know, it's not, not you know, every generation at most should have constitutional questions raised. If it's kind of every year you raise the exact same general question, there's there, there are, there, there do become, uh, I think, principled worries about whether you're just asking people in order to get, you know, asking people to vote until they do the right thing. But I think so long as it's a different, you know, so long as you're asking people um, different, you know, as you say, different stages in the process, I don't think there's a democratic reason to object. Um, again, there might be practical reasons in the case of certain certain kinds of uh, certain kinds of legislation, but um, you know, I, I don't think democracy per se would would um, you know prohibit it. Um, so I basically agree. Uh, I won't weigh in on whether that should have happened in the in the British case. You guys will have to uh, resolve these matters on your own. I'm an American, but. Um, <laughs> You know, and I'll just say as a matter of principle, I don't disagree. Yeah. Interesting that you mentioned the, the Swiss, Greg. I just wonder how much their passion for referendums, uh, which continues, of course, uh, might have been something important um, for Dicey. Oh, it was very, I mean, it was very important. It's interesting. I, he was a part of this brief period where I think the Swiss weighed extremely heavily and uh, thinking about this, there were a number of books brought out in, in this period. The late Victorians were quite interested in. It sort of culminates, I think, with Bryce's Modern Democracies in, in the early 1920s. It's probably the last book of this, where he says, really, you know, the Swiss are one of the great models of democracy, right? Along with there's, there's Britain, uh, you know, there's America, and there's the Swiss. These are the three great versions of democracy. We don't we don't exactly talk this way today, but you know, there's kind of parliamentary democracy, all of Britain, there's a pres presidential um, separation of powers model a la America, and this, this sort of referendal yes. democracy um, a la Switzerland. Um, that they've kind of, you know, they, they don't weigh as heavily in kind of comparative politics or political theoretical reflection now, but there was this period where they, where they did. But also Dicey is looking quite heavily at American state constitutions where, um, at that period, there's a huge burst of revision of American state constitutions and um, referendums and the initiative, which he doesn't necessarily love, are brought into a lot of them then. Um, and uh, other, you know, throughout parts of um, the uh, of the empire, uh, the constitutions that are being uh, brought into play, like in Australia, include um, referendums. So I think he thinks this is part of a broader, some, um, Historians and political scientists have said this is part of the first 
this kind of period when he's writing at the end of the 19th into the early 20th century is the first worldwide referendum wave. So um, uh, I think, you know, there's just some truth to the fact that he, he did have reason to look around and think this was, this was the future. And the important thing was to figure out what the best uh, mechanism was for kind of implementing, you know, um, you know, what, what was the best, what was the best mechanism uh, of, of direct democracy and what was the way in which it could be made most compatible with the good aspects of parliamentary government? Um, because some version of this was, was kind of ineluctable. Um, and it's so Switzerland is his favorite case because he thinks Switzerland works well. As he says, uh, quite frankly, it's the most successful democracy in the world, he says. But uh, it's not the only thing he's, he's looking at. Yeah. Now, friends, there is time for one more question or so. We have a lot of participants. Um, and if any would now like to um, uh, go into reactions and, like Anthony, put up a hand, then there is still time for, for one more question before we ought to bring things to a close. So speak now or forever hold your peace. Greg, would you like to say something in conclusion before I sum up for us all? Um, what can I say in conclusion? Well, just maybe to say a little bit about the, you know, the book, I think, um, you know, I, I hope that uh, people might go out and read the book. For me, it was an honor to be included in the series, which was, um, you know, my first exposure to some, the great texts of the history of political thought. Uh, was through the series as an undergrad. So it was a great honor to be included. And I think one of the things um, that I hope comes through in the volume is that there's a lot, not just about the referendum, but a lot of other interesting um, things that, uh, you know, ways that you might think with, or or if you prefer kind of against Dicey that are interesting that come out in, in um, in the volume. So you get snippets while it's largely oriented around the referendum and these questions of democracy. One thing that came up a little bit in our discussion was federalism. Yeah. Uh, Dicey was, uh, I think, probably the greatest uh, student of federalism among the Victorians. Um, and he admired what the Americans had done, but was also a real critic of federalism. So just to mention one thing, he said that uh, federalism was uh, necessarily a legalistic weak and conservative form of government. And this is why he didn't like it. And, you know, you, so snippets of that come out in this volume too. I don't include, you know, his, his whole, the whole of his disquisitions on federalism, but you see some of that in this volume. Um, and, uh, you know, if those kinds of things interest you, you can go and read it. Certainly, I think uh, assessments like that are worth grappling with. I, you know, for me as a citizen of a federal republic, it's important to Ask yourself whether that's true. I mean, was yeah. he right about that? Um, Dicey is also interesting as a kind of one reason he liked the referendum was because he thought it was a way to um, cabin in the power of uh, parliamentary parties without um, bringing in American style judicial review, which he also opposed, despite being seen as a kind of great lawyer and theorist of the rule of law. He did not like American style judicial supremacy. That's another thing worth thinking of. You know, he's kind of critic of judicial review since his own time. Um, most liberal democracies uh, have become much more heavily judicialized. Um, and that's a general trend across sort of Western uh, liberal states. And so I think, you know, you can also glimpse some of that in this volume and his other writings. And we're thinking about that as well. Um, so uh, anyway, and I'll just conclude by uh, thanking you again, Quentin, for uh, continuing with the, uh, you know, for keeping the series up and running and also for conducting this interview. So thanks to everyone. Well, I th our, our thanks are to you, Greg, for answering all these questions with such tremendous learning and, and fluency, extremely interesting. So very many thanks on behalf of all to Greg for taking us through some of these complex legal and constitutional questions, but they're immediate for us as well as complex.
So very important to think about. Thanks also to Victoria Whittinger, which oh, yes, thank you. Um, who uh, at CUP has organized this occasion and has done so with, I may say, great patience, as well as complete efficiency. So thank you also for, to Victoria. And also, mm -hmm. finally, as we come up to the hour, thank you all very much, those of you who tuned in.